Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining this webinar tonight. And uh, I would like to welcome you all. My name is Denis Savelyev. I am AGC administrator. And before we start, I would like just to mention that uh, there will be an opportunity to ask questions during this webinar. So there is a button like Q&A button, like, which usually is used on Zoom. So please uh, send your questions using this button. And at the end of the talk, Samuel will be answering the questions. And just before we proceed, I would like to make maybe a few small announcements. There's, uh, it's the Arthur Jeffrey Center, apart from open lectures, we also have a range of different courses on Islam. And we have one which is upcoming very soon. So it starts in a couple of weeks. It, it is on understanding the Hadith. So if you want to understand the secondary, most important body of literature in Islam, you can enroll to this course. There is 10 more days for doing so. And we have several courses that are running in the first semester of the next year. It is the, uh, the Quranic Arabic class. It's class on the ministry to Muslims. Uh, it is uh, a, a class on Islamic thinkers and a class on ministry to Muslims. So if you're interested in knowing more, you can enroll in, in these classes later on. And let me pass this stage on to the director of AGC, Richard Schumach, and he will introduce our guest speaker tonight. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Richard. I'm the director of the Arthur Jeffrey Center, and it's my uh, honor and pleasure to introduce to you our lecturer for this evening. Uh, I've known Samuel Green for many years. I can't even remember where we first met, but um, he is very well known around the traps, particularly the debating traps. He is an internationally renowned uh, debater with Muslims. I've seen him live. I've seen him on YouTube. Uh, one of the things that I very much respect about Samuel is uh, his grace, his patience, his gentleness as he does debates. Um, I've witnessed him personally uh, privately tutoring the uh, Muslim debater uh, just in how to do debates well, how to speak in a way that finds truth and creates light and not heat. Um, it's very impressive. He also has um, material that is used to train Christians, particularly on university campuses around Australia and internationally, and he's written a brilliant book, uh, which is called Where to Start with Islam. It's a really excellent uh, and quite original introduction to just having good conversations with Muslims about Christ. Uh, I commend all those resources, but um, again, it's a pleasure to introduce to you, Samuel. Um, he's a man of gentleness and grace and wisdom around this topic. So Samuel, take us away with teaching Christianity to understand Islam. Thank you, Richard, for those kind words and for that introduction. I will get my notes up here. And what I plan to do is to speak for about 40 minutes. And then I plan, sorry, I plan to speak for about 40 minutes and then to um, ha have questions at the end. Uh, so to begin, I wanna thank MST for this opportunity. It's an honor to be invited to speak today. I know that many of you watching have great experience and knowledge in this area, and I've learned from you, and I look forward to sharing with you today my ideas. Uh, to everyone who is keen out there to engage with their Muslim friends, I hope that you'll find this material helpful. Uh, for those of us who learn about Islam, and study it in the way that MST does and, and other people do in other ways. I actually think that we have a unique role within the church because 
not only do we learn about Islam for our own ministry, but very often we're the ones who are called upon to teach and explain Islam and how to talk to Muslims in our churches. And, and so we have a special role in that sense as we, as we think about this question tonight. Uh, and there is a need for us to learn about Islam. Uh, several reasons I can think of. One is that Muslims need to hear the gospel. Muslims are people of the world and they need to hear the gospel. There are millions of Muslims being welcomed into Western countries. And so they are uh, around us, they're, they're within our populations. Uh, even if we don't go overseas to meet Muslims, we're, we're gonna meet them in our own countries. And so there's a need there. And of course, Muslims ask Christians questions. And so Christians need to be informed about Islam because of, of these types of reasons. And so the question that I'm uh, looking at today is, how should we be teaching Islam? How should Christians teach Islam to other Christians? And again, as, I, as I'm thinking about the, the Melbourne School of Theology's uh, clientele, the people who come along and, and, and are probably watching this, um, as I said, we will be the ones who, who, are, who are called upon to do this. And so we have a, a special role within the church to think about it. And what I want us to think about is, um, how, how do we uh, proceed? What's the best way of teaching the church in general, to teaching the average Christian about Islam? Where should we start in that regard? And that's what I want to explore today. Now, my, um, I'm going to slip, switch over to my PowerPoint now. Hopefully, you'll still be able to see me. So where are we? Let's go PowerPoint. Share screen. There we are. So this is the structure of what I want to do today. Um, I've got uh, sort of five points there. I want to look at what Muslims learn about Christianity, and you'll see how that's important for how we think about engaging with Muslims and how we teach Islam. And then I'm going to give three suggestions for how we can teach Christianity to understand Islam. And, and that's going to be my contention that the way forward for teaching Christians about Islam is to actually work out ways of teaching Christianity, which when we teach that truth of Christi Christianity, will give the Christian a great insight into Islam. And I'm going to look at three areas. I'm going to look at Christianity in the Quran. I'm going to look at what is the Bible and I will look at uh, temple theology. So let's begin with the first of these. And we're going to look at, um, we're going to look at what Muslims learn about Christianity. And I want to begin here by saying that when it comes to Islam, it's, in, it's important to know history. It's important to know history, but maybe not history in the way that you're thinking. Very often when we think of history, we think of historical events and historical facts that maybe we need to remember the dates for and you know what happened and who did what. And it certainly is helpful to do that. But I want to suggest that when it comes to Islam, there's something else that we need to do. And that is we need to appreciate where we fit on the historical timeline, where we fit on the historical timeline. And what I mean by that is, Islam comes roughly five to 600 years after Christianity, depending upon how you want to, to measure that. But five or 600 years after Christianity. And that's actually a long period of time. Five, 600 years is a long period of time. And what this means is that in practice, we learn about each other very differently. So for Christians, when we read the Bible, we don't read about Islam. When we see Jesus walking around Jerusalem, we don't see him talking to Muslims. If he was in Jerusalem today, he'd be talking to Muslims. When we read the book of Acts, we don't see the apostles evangelizing Muslims. If they're in the Middle East today, you know, and Paul was in the, doing his missionary journeys that we're familiar with him doing, 
he'd be meeting Muslims. And we'd be reading about it in the book of Acts. But because Islam comes five to 600 years after Christianity, we don't read about Islam in the Bible. And so for Christians, we, we don't think much about Islam just from being Christian. The situation is actually the exact opposite for the Muslim. Because Islam comes five to 600 years after Christianity, what you find is that Christianity is mentioned many times in the Quran because Muhammad was surrounded by Christianity. In fact, he, he spent some time as a refugee in Ethiopia in a Christian kingdom. And he traveled as a, as a trader into Syria. And so he's, 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 got, he's got Christian wives. So Muhammad is surrounded by Christianity. And this is reflected in the Quran where it speaks a lot about Christianity. And so for Muslims, they learn about Christianity just from being Muslim. They learn Christianity just from being Muslim. And what I want to do now is just very quickly go through what is it that Muslims learn about Christianity to, to lay a bit of a foundation for, one of, for what I want to say later on. Let's look at this first reference that's, uh, that, that's on the screen for you. It says, they, this is from the Quran. They said, we killed Christ Jesus, the son of Mary, the apostle of God, but they killed him not nor crucified him. But so it was made to appear to them. And those who differ about this are full of doubts with no knowledge, but only assumption to follow. For of certainty, they killed him not. Rather, God raised him to himself. Now, there's one of the Quran's descriptions of what happened to Jesus on the cross. And for most Muslims, they, they assume that it's saying that Jesus never died on the cross. Uh, and what it says there is that he only appeared to be crucified and killed. My point that I just want to bring up here is Muslims are taught a doctrine of the cross. It's not just Christians who have books like John Stott, The Cross of Christ. Muslims have their own books teaching about what happened on the cross. Let's go down to our next, uh, our next verse here. They are unbelievers who say God is the third of three. Now, I'm sure you know what that's referring to. It's referring to the Trinity. They are unbelievers who say God is the third of three. No God is there but one God. The Messiah, son of Mary, was only a messenger. Messengers before him passed away. His mother was just a woman. They both ate food. So here we see the Quran uh, speaking about the Trinity and the incarnation. Now, you can see that Muhammad is an outsider to Christianity. He hasn't been instructed in it because he speaks of the Trinity in terms of God, Mary, and Jesus. Uh, Mary and Jesus both ate food. That is, they're, they're not gods. But this is Muhammad's understanding. From, from where he got that idea, we're not sure. But he's an outsider. But nevertheless, Muslims are prepared and are taught from just being Muslim to reject the Trinity, or that there even is a Trinity, and to reject it, and the idea of the incarnation. Let's look at our next verse here. It is not fitting that the merciful should take to himself a son. There is none in the heavens and the earth who will not come to the merciful except as a slave. Now, here is the Quran's verse, amongst a few others, which rule out the fatherhood of God and the son of God and the son of God to anyone. It's not just that Jesus is not the son of God. It's that no one is. God is not the, the, the uh, God is not father. Now, I just want you to think about those three verses that I've given from the Quran here, which are just the normal information that Muslims pick up from, from the mosque or from their culture. The cross, the, 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 uh, the trinity, the incarnation, and the fatherhood and the son of God. I want to suggest to you that they are our three, uh, that, that they are some of our most unique Christian doctrines. And Islam actually prepares Muslims for them. Just being Muslim means you learn the chief unique doctrines of Christianity and through, throughout Islamic history, how to reject them. But it's even more than this. Muslims actually learn a hermeneutic. They learn how to read the Bible. Let the people of the gospel judge by what God has revealed therein. If any do fail to judge by what God has revealed, they are no better than those who rebel. 
to you Muslims, we sent the scripture in truth, confirming the scripture that came before it and guarding it in safety. So judge between them by what God has revealed. Now, this verse begins by saying that the people of the gospel, that is Christians, should judge by what God has revealed in the gospel. So it's actually encouraging Christians to read the Bible. But notice how it ends. It says that Muslims have got their own scripture and they're to judge other scripture by their scripture. And so this actually gives Muslims, as it's worked out in their history, a hermeneutic. They're taught that there is the Bible and how they are, are, are to approach the Bible. So not only are they taught about our key doctrines, they're taught how to approach the Bible and how to interpret it. And it normally means uh, reading the Bible and judging it and picking out what's true and false according to the Quran. But it's a hermeneutic that they have. Whoops, I'll just go back there. But there's more than just um, hermeneutical preparation they get. Point E, permitted to Muslim men in marriage are the chaste women of the believers and the chaste women are those who have been given the scripture before you, Christians and Jews. That is, Muslim men can marry Christian women. And so the Quran actually gives Islamic culture romantic preparation for how to engage with Christians. I've actually had a Muslim come to my church looking for a wife. He, he couldn't find a wife in Australia. And, uh, and he said, I'm going to go to a church where I know there are pure Christian girls because he's allowed to marry a, a Christian girl. And so either deliberately or inadvertently through this, Islam can establish itself very quickly in Christian areas. But that's some type of preparation, isn't it? Romantic preparation. Whoops. Uh, the, the Quran also gives uh, community preparation. So in point F, you will certainly find the nearest in friendship to those who believe to be those who say we are Christians. And so here we have earlier on in Muhammad's life, Muhammad saying that Christians are the nearest to Muslims. And of course, this is where your Muslim friend, most Muslim friends want to be with you. They, they want to be your friend. But of course, that's not where the Quran ends. Uh, it actually ends with Muhammad's great commission from the, the last main chapter of the Quran, which says, fight those who believe not in God in the last day and do not forbid what God and his messenger Muhammad have forbidden. Such men as practice not the religion of truth, being of those who have been given the book until they pay the tribute, the terms of surrender out of hand and have been humbled. And here's the reason the Jews say, Ezra is the son of God. The Christians say the Messiah is the son of God. That is the utterance of their mouths conforming with the unbelievers before them. God assail them, how they are perverted. It is he who has sent his messenger with the guidance and the religion of truth that he may uplift it above every religion. And so it is absolutely true that Muslims would want to be our friends. But according to the teachings of the Quran, ultimately, Islam is meant to rule. And historically, the, uh, Muhammad did not send out missionaries. He sent out jihadists. And the jihadists followed the instructions of Muhammad. And they, they conquered the Christians, as we see this verse told them to do. So I want to suggest to you that there's a, there's a lot of preparation that the Quran gives to Muslims. And that is just part of Islamic culture for how to engage with Christians. What about Islam in the Bible? Well, as I've said, when we read the Bible, we don't actually see Islam ever mentioned directly because it didn't exist. And when Christians want to learn about Islam, we do it in a very general sense, in the same way that we might learn about Buddhism or Hinduism or anything like that. We'd probably get a book on world religions and, and find out about Islam that way. Now, what's the result of this? Well, the result is... Let me just go up to here. Um, the result is, and I'll stop my screen share at the moment. Um, the result of this is that Islam prepares Muslims for Christianity in a way that Christianity does not prepare Christians for Islam. We learn about each other very differently. In fact, I would want to argue that this is the most important cultural aspect to understand between Christianity and Islam. For Muslims, it's actually compulsory to learn about 
Christianity and how to refute it. Whereas for Christians, it's completely optional and something that even a mature Christian may never do. Now, this, of course, is significant for our evangelism, because when you talk to a Muslim, you're not talking to uh, someone like a Buddhist or a Hindu who may have no idea about Christianity and will believe what you say. If you say to a Buddhist or a Hindu, Jesus died on the cross, they'll go, okay, he died on the cross, they'll believe that. But for the Muslim, as many of us will know, if you say a, almost any gospel claim, the Muslim's prepared for it. The Muslim's prepared for it. And so you can see here, there is a need for us to, to learn how to teach Christians about Islam, not just because the Muslims need to hear the gospel, not just because Muslims are coming into Western countries, but because Islam among the religions of the world, particularly trains its followers to engage with Christians. And so for those of us who are involved in Christian ministry and training others about Islam, we need to think about what to do here because Islam is, is different to other religions in the way that it prepares its followers to engage with Christians. And so this raises the question, which I've, uh, I said at the beginning, how should we teach Islam um, to, to, to Christians? How should Christians be teaching Islam to other Christians? Well, I want to now move over to my three suggestions for the second half of my talk. And I've got three suggestions here. Um, my first suggestion is that we teach what the Quran says about Christianity to explain Islam. We teach what the Quran says about Christianity to explain Islam. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, the Quran teaches many topics. If you read the Quran, there are a whole range of topics in there. And we have to choose which one we're going to say to people, particularly if we've only got limited time or one seminar that we're giving, or, or we want to know where to start and what's a key point that we want to say to people. We need to choose amongst the many topics that are taught in the Quran, which topic to choose. Now, traditionally, the way that we've done this is that we've uh, is that we've taught, the, say, the five pillars of Islam. So the, the confession of faith, the uh, fasting during Ramadan, the praying uh, five times a day, the pilgrimage to Mecca and the money to Islamic causes. And so we'll go through the five pillars and uh, you know, we'll explain each of those pillars in detail. Or we might look at some of the basic beliefs of Islam. Um, and, and this is the way that Islam would present itself to us with the pillars and the basic beliefs. Um, and books on world religion typically do that type of thing. We may look at some history and have a look at some maps. And I actually did that for about uh, 12 or 15 years when I was training on the university campuses and I had my one chance to train people, I would give them the five pillars, the basic beliefs and some maps and that type of thing. But what I found was that a lot of the people I taught that to forgot those details. They forgot them because they never actually had to use them. They just weren't called upon to use them. They were helpful information. They're certainly how Muslims like to present their faith to us. But if you came back and asked a lot of the people I taught about the five pillars or the basic beliefs, they probably couldn't remember them. And certainly they didn't find them helpful in their evangelism. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, if you go and meet a Muslim and uh, 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 the questions of God come up, I personally have never had a Muslim say to me, let me tell you about the five pillars. I've just never had a Muslim say that to me. I've spoken to a lot of Muslims. What they've almost always said to me is what the Quran teaches them about Christianity. And so what I'm suggesting is that if we're going to have to choose what part of the Quran to teach people to give them an introduction to Christianity, that the place to actually, sorry, an introduction to Islam, that the place to begin is not with the pillars of Islam, which they probably will never talk to a Muslim about, but actually to talk about what does the Quran say about Christianity and to look at that. Now, what I have found is when I explain to Muslims what the Quran says about Christianity, which I just did for you in the first half of the talk, that they remember those things. 
they get a, a picture of, of what to expect when they talk to a Muslim. And I've just found that that information is much more useful to them. And I want to say it is actually teaching authentic Islam. You might think, oh, you're not really teaching Islam when you do that. I want to say, yes, I am. Because the topic of Christianity is a major subject in the Quran. It takes up a lot of space. In fact, I would argue it takes up more space than the pillars of Islam. Okay, let's take the subject of uh, praying, the Salat. The Quran does not say pray five times a day. It doesn't give those details. It does say to pray and that if you pray that that's, uh, that can do certain benefits for you. But there's not many details about how to pray. You, you could not come away from the Quran and go straight to what happens in the mosque. There's a lot of other steps that have to be worked out through the Hadith and other material to get there. And so I actually think that teaching about Christianity is teaching a major subject and that just to focus on the pillars of Islam is not really a true representation of what Islam actually is. And in practice, I just think that this is a much better place for us to begin. Um, it's a lot closer to home for Christians, and I've just found that it's uh, much easier for them to remember. Now, also, I have found that in terms of evangelism, it's really helpful for Christians to understand that Islam teaches about Christianity. The reason I say that is it provides us with an excellent evangelistic opportunity that does not require us to know about Islam. What I mean by that is what I've just shown you in the first half of the talk shows you that Muslims are meant to learn about Christianity. Just think about that. Being Muslim means you're meant to learn about Christianity. That actually provides us with an amazing opportunity. And this is actually a whole seminar that I'll give on its own, but just a, a brief introduction here. Um, what this means is that you can ask a Muslim, what have you heard about Christianity? And find out what they say, to just listen to them, just listen to them and you will find out who they are, where they're coming from. You'll find out a lot of helpful information to know where to proceed from. And you don't have to know anything about Islam. You're actually just talking about Christianity. So this is why I, be, this is why I feel that we can, uh, that the place to begin in teaching Islam is by helping Christians to understand what Islam teaches about Christianity. And uh, and then from that, helping them to see how they can use that in their evangelism. So that's my first point. Teach what the Quran says about Christianity to explain Islam. Now, my second point is to, uh, is to say, if we want to teach Christianity to explain Islam, I think a great subject for us to talk about is what is the Bible? Okay, what is the Bible? And this can be something which, as Christians, we rarely teach our congregations or something that we rarely think about. And so we, well, the things I'm going to say in a moment, we can just assume them, but not realize how uh, glorious they are and how impressive they are to Muslims. Now, what do I mean? Well, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Um, the Bible is not one book. It's a collection of many books from many prophets over about a 1500 year period. It begins with the Torah, the law of Moses, but then moves into the books of, of other prophets. And, and there's about 40 different prophets all up throughout the Bible. It has uh, the Torah, the books of the Psalms, um, the, the, the books of range of the books of many different prophets. As I've said, uh, it has uh, the, the the four gospel accounts with the apostles' writings from Jesus' apostles. It actually covers a long period of time from many different prophets in different languages from different locations. It's actually an impressive book. Now, I'm going to go back to my slide here. I will share my screen again. And I just want you to look at this diagram 
to see the unity of Scripture. The Bible is an impressive book. Have a look at the unity of Scripture there across all of the prophets over 1,500 years. Humanity is created in the image of God. That's the unified message. The fatherhood and the son of God is taught in various ways throughout all the prophets over those 1,500 years. That God comes to dwell with his people. That humanity is corrupted by sin. That there's the priesthood and the sacrifice of atonement. The covenants of Noah, Abraham, Moses, of David. That one story of redemption. You see, the Bible is an impressive book. It's not just one prophet telling you whatever. It's actually all of the prophets of God with one unified message over 1,500 years, different locations coming to their fulfillment in the person of Jesus. There's actually no book like the Bible. It is an amazing book. Now, let me just move back to this. Now, I'll keep it up here, but look at the Quran and Islam, because the Quran and Islam is very different. You see, the Quran is just one man. The Quran is one man telling you what to believe about the other prophets. Now, this is important because Muslims will say to us, we believe all the prophets. Well, no, they don't. Never let a Muslim say to you they believe all the prophets because they don't. What they actually believe is Muhammad and what he tells them about the prophets, right? You see, the Quran does not have any of the Bible in it. I was just speaking to a man last night, a, a dear brother, and Muslims had told him that they believe all the prophets. And so he assumed that some of the Old Testament was in the Quran. And I said to him, no, no, no. And, and I've heard this from many Christians, actually. They assume that the Quran has some of the books of the Bible in it, some of the Old Testament books. No, no, no. The Quran has none of the books of the Bible in it. It just has what Muhammad said. Okay. And so when Muslims want to learn about, uh, about Moses, they believe what Muhammad said about Moses. They listen to Muhammad. When they want to learn about David, they listen to everything Muhammad said about David. When they want to learn about Solomon, they learn everything Muhammad said about Solomon. When they learn about uh, Jonah or Job or Jesus, they don't read the, the books of those prophets. They, they just listen to Muhammad. You see, Islam is identical to the Baha'i religion. It's exactly the same as the Baha'i religion. The, ba the Baha'i religion believe in all the prophets, but they only believe what their prophet says about those prophets. Okay? They only believe what their prophet says about those prophets. The Baha'i believe in Muhammad. The Baha'i believe in, in Jesus. You cannot be a Baha'i unless you love Muhammad unless you love Jesus. This is exactly the same as the Muslims. Their religion is based on one man and what he tells them to believe. But Christianity is nothing like that. And when we teach Muslims and when we teach Christians what the Bible is and then compare it to the Quran, we're teaching them an amazing thing about the Bible. We're teaching them something that they probably just assume and, as, and, and never thought was a, 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 an important thing, but actually is a very important thing. When we teach people what the Bible is, we're teaching them that Christians are the ones who believe all the prophets and that what we believe about God comes from all the prophets and not from one man. And that Islam is just one man's religion, one man telling you what to believe about all the prophets and that it's exactly the same type of religion as the Baha'i religion. So that's my second point there. That's how I feel we can teach Christianity to help Christians better understand Islam. And so we do that by teaching and explaining what the Bible is and that it's all the prophets. And then we contrast that to the, Bible, to the Quran and Christians get the point. Christians get the point. What we believe is all the prophets. Muslims just believe one man. Now, my third and final point is to, to speak about the temple. And I want to show how um, teaching about the temple is a great way to help Christians understand Islam. So let me just change my slide here. Here is the temple, uh, sorry, the temple in Jerusalem is central to the Bible. 
It's absolutely central. And when we read the Bible, we see that the Holy Spirit actually taught us important things through the temple. And so I'm just teaching Christianity here. So let me read to you from Hebrews. But only the high priest entered the inner room, and that only once a year, and never without blood, which he offered for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was showing by this that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed as long as the first tabernacle was still standing. Now, I just want you to notice here how the, the Holy Spirit was showing something by the construction of the temple. So here, the Holy Spirit was showing. And so the Holy Spirit actually teaches us things through the temple. What is it that the Holy Spirit teaches us through the temple? What are the doctrines associated with the temple? Well, the first doctrine is that God comes to dwell with us. God comes to dwell with us. We're not on a journey to God. God comes to dwell with us. God came and dwelt with Adam. God dwelt with the nation of Israel in the tabernacle. And, the, and in, the, uh, the, in the temple of Solomon, God's presence filled the temple. God dwells with his people. The second uh, doctrine that we learn from the temple is the priest. Now, the priest shows us that we need a mediator between us and God. And that's because when a holy God comes to dwell with a sinful people, it's not an easy meeting. And so there's this the teaching within the Bible on the priest. The priest is the mediator between us and God, between a holy God and man. The priest represents God to the people, and the priest represents the people to God. He has this God and man uh, function within the priest. We see the sacrifice of atonement. Again, if you want to come as a sinner before a holy God, you can't. You can't approach God. And the only way you can do it is by a sacrifice of atonement being offered on your behalf by somebody who's acceptable, the priest, to do it on your, on your behalf. And so we learn about the sacrifice of atonement. And, uh, you know, and the sacrifice of atonement, it's more than just forgiveness. It's actually, it actually allows you to be forgiven so that you can come into God's presence, come before God. And I'm sure that for most of us, we're familiar with these doctrines. But now I want to bring up the next point, and that is that the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD, and this had a massive effect on Muhammad, because Muhammad was born 500 years after the destruction of the temple, 500 years after the destruction of the temple. And by that time, temple Judaism had become rabbinic Judaism. Temple Judaism had become rabbinic Judaism, and the practices of the temple are no longer being practiced. Now, why is that important? Well, because Muhammad copied the Christians and the Jews. This is from Sahith Bukhari, but it's agreed, and it's in Muslim as well. Narrated Ibn Abbas, the prophet used to copy the people of the scriptures in matters in which there was no order from Allah. The people of the scripture used to let their hair hang down while the prophets used to part their hair. So the prophet let his hair hang down first, but later on he parted it. Now here we see Muhammad being influenced by the Christians and the Jews, and it's actually saying that he would copy them in matters in which Allah had not spoken to him. And, and to begin with, he follows the, the, the fashion he wanted to identify in his dress and appearance as, as a Jew or as a Christian. And so he would wear his hair that way. But then later on, he wore his hair in a different way to associate with the, with, the, with the Arab peoples. But the result of Muhammad copying the, Christ, the practices of the Christians and the Jews is Muhammad did not learn temple theology. He did not learn temple theology. And so if you teach Christians temple theology and the doctrines that go with the temple, you can then very quickly show them how to understand Islam. Because when you come to the Quran, what you'll find is that the doctrines of the temple are not there. This is the easiest way to understand the Quran. There is no temple theology. So Jerusalem itself is never mentioned in the Quran. 
uh, there may be a reference to it in Surah, 8, uh, Surah 17, but it's called the mosque and appears to be still standing. Um, so Muhammad has little understanding of it. It's interesting that when we look at Abraham building the Kaaba, uh, he builds the Kaaba. And what would you expect after Abraham has built the Kaaba if there was temple theology? Well, you'd expect the glory of God to fill it. Uh, but that doesn't happen. They just build it and they just build it. It becomes a place of prayer. Why is it a place of prayer? Why do you pray towards it? Well, for the temple, the reason why you prayed towards the temple in Jerusalem was that's where God's name dwelt. But Islam today really has no reason for why you pray to the Kaaba. You just pray there. It doesn't have any temple theology. There's actually no reason to pray to the Kaaba. There are, when you read the stories of Moses, Jesus, and Aaron, there's no temple theology in their stories. Yes, Jesus has, has but Mary's mother is in the, the sanctuary, but nothing's really made of that. She's just, she's just there. There's no doctrines of the temple that are actually worked out. And so Aaron is not a priest in the Quran. Aaron is, is just a prophet. So it's not just that the Quran makes Jesus just a prophet. The Quran also makes Aaron just a prophet. Uh, as I mentioned before, there's no Shekinah glory. There's no glory of the Lord that comes to dwell with his people. In fact, by the time you get to the Quran, the word Shekinah has completely changed its meaning. And I've given you some references there. You can look, you can look them up. It just means peace and tranquility. But it's completely moved on from its original meaning because there's no temple theology in the Quran. And so my point here is that uh, there's no temple doctrines in the Quran and th the temple doctrines in many ways are, are not refuted either. They're just absent. Now, let me just get back to here. Some brief applications before we finish up. Um, the temple is actually really important. No, sorry, I rushed ahead of myself. And so that's my third uh, example of how you can teach Christianity to explain Islam to teach a congregation, to teach Christians temple theology, help them work through all the, the elements of what we learn about the temple, teach them that, and then simply show them how it's absent in the Quran. And what I have found when I've done this is that Christians really appreciate having learned temple theology. They feel like they've grown in their own faith. <clears throat> Excuse me, they've understood their own faith better. And by understanding their own faith better, they now understand the Quran better. They now understand Islam better. Uh, just as that's the same with, with, the, with the Bible. As they understand what the Bible is better, they understand better what the Quran is better. So they've learned Christianity to understand Islam. Now, coming back to the applications, um, obviously learning about the, the, the temple and temple doctrines are important because the incarnation is described as Jesus being the temple. Uh, as Jesus being God coming to dwell with us, as Jesus being our priest, as the one offering up the sacrifice of atonement. And so understanding the temple is, uh, has great practical application for knowing what Muslims don't know. Um, now, what I've just given you here is a, let me turn that off before I uh, finish up. Um, I've, I've tried to give you a bit of a summary of some of the chapters from my book, um, which Richard mentioned before. That's published through Matthias Media and you can get it in all the local bookshops. And I've got lots of this type of material in the form of evangelistic booklets uh, on my website and training there. If you wanted to take that further, you could take that further. So I'll conclude now. <clears throat> um, today we saw that there is a need for Christians to learn and to teach about Islam. There are many Muslims coming into Western countries, and so we have them around us, and they need to hear the gospel like everyone else does. We're sending missionaries overseas, and so we need to be training them and thinking this through. But we've also seen that the Islamic world is quite prepared to engage with us. And so we need to be thinking a bit more when it comes to Islam because of the preparation that they have. Today, as a result of this, I've been exploring the question of how Christians should be teaching other Christians about Islam. 
And my suggestion has been that we, uh, rather than give lots of details about the Quran that we expect Christians to remember, and that most likely won't be that useful to them in their evangelism, not initially anyway, instead the way forward is to think of ways of teaching Christianity to explain Islam. And the three examples that I gave were to show what the Quran says about Christianity, to explain what the Bible is and how it's all the prophets and the Quran is just one man, and to, to teach Christians temple theology and to show them how that uh, the Quran, that, that all of these doctrines are missing from Islam and that we need to, to think about how to bring those doctrines to Islam. So I will finish up there. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Samuel, can you please answer to the question? Right. <laughs> Sorry, I will begin there now. Let me just turn this around here. Get, get that light a bit further around. Um, so where do I, so let me just look at the time here. Thank you. Um, Muhammad, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Diana Summers. You are absolutely correct. Muhammad never went to Ethiopia, but 101 of his disciples did. Thank you for that correction. Um, yes, you are, you are absolutely correct. Uh, I was wrong there. And, um, uh, but, but the point I was making was that uh, he and his, uh, he's influenced by what's happening there. And he, he's well aware of Christians, but thank you for that correction. Uh, Tina Cannon, what other things are Muslims taught about Christianity? Uh, for instance, is the Christian West, uh, is, is the Christian West immoral? Uh, yes, now Muslims are taught a whole range of things about Christianity because it's just on their agenda. It's part of what they do. I was speaking to a Muslim at uh, the university, uh, a university in Western Australia. And I was talking to him about how we learn about each other differently. And he said to me, you're absolutely right. He said, you know, we'll have whole series in the mosques where the, the sermon and, and the training in the mosque will be how to talk to, to Muslims. And that's something that will go to all Muslims. All Muslims will be required to learn this. Whereas, you know, it's very different for us as Christians. So, um, now, what are some of the other things they're taught? Well, uh, they're taught that the Bible's corrupted very often. They are taught, as you've suggested here, that the, the West uh, is immoral. And so they will, um, they will bring up issues about it. Look, they're even taught things for the Muslim who's learning, that they're even learning our council. So they'll know about the Council of Nicaea. Now, what they'll know about it will be wrong, um, but they're still taught about the councils. You know, are, are we taught about the early discussions about Tawhid in, in Islamic history? You know, we, we don't learn about those things, but they do learn about Nicaea. And very often they'll bring that up uh, as a way of, of uh, being critical of Christianity. And most Christians don't learn about Nicaea. And so we, you know, it, it can play into the Muslim hand. Um, uh, they'll learn about Paul very often. They'll learn about Paul and how Paul is the corrupter. Uh, so, uh, the, so look, they, they are taught other things. I can't think of anything else at the moment, but um, if you just get online and have a look around, you'll be able to find out other things. Um, are Muslims, oh, sorry, so uh, Tina can again, are Muslims taught that Christians have corrupted their Bible. Uh, yes, they are commonly taught that. Uh, it's actually not what the Quran teaches at all. Uh, it's not what the Quran teaches at all. I had a debate with Shabir Ali, for those who are interested on this. If you go to my YouTube channel, you can watch my debate with him where I give a full presentation on it and there's material on it in my book. Um, but I, I give, it, I give a, a, a short presentation with Shabir there. Uh, the Quran says on many occasions that no distinction is to be made between any of the holy books. Uh, no distinction is to be made. 
and that Muhammad and the Muslims are to read the Bible or to consult the Bible if they want to know that the Quran is true. And uh, Muhammad is meant to be foretold in the Bible. You can know that the the Bible, you know that, that Muhammad is a true prophet because his teaching confirms the Bible. And so the Quran is very positive. It actually says that the gospel that was given to Jesus is what Christians have. And so it's very specific. It's what they have between their hands. Um, so Muslims are taught that. Now, why are they taught that? They're taught that because the Quran says it confirms the Bible. The Quran says Muhammad's foretold in the Bible, but it does not confirm the Bible. It does, Muhammad is not foretold in the Bible. How do you explain that? You've either got to say Muhammad's false, what he said is wrong, or you blame Christians. And this is actually quite a callous act on behalf of Islam that because what Muhammad said isn't true, you, you've got to come up with an answer. Or sorry, because of what Muhammad said in the Quran doesn't appear to be true, you've got to come up with an answer. And so Muslims have taken the path of blaming Christians. They actually blame us for what Muhammad said. Just think about that. We get blamed for what Muhammad said not being the case. That's why they attack the Bible. That's the only reason they attack the Bible. You would not come away from the Quran attacking the Bible. You only attack the Bible because of other reasons. Um, uh, Dennis, can you please show the first slide on the Bible? That we were not able to see. Yes, I'm sorry I didn't have that up and it was uh, a little hard to, to see that. So I will share screen again. So th this is the standard diagram that I use in my training. And if you send me an email, I'll send you the, uh, the image. Um, and so th this is what I use for, for teaching the Bible to Christians. This is what I use for teaching the Bible to Christians. I show them the unity of scripture. I show them how we believe all the prophets. I show them how you know all of the major themes of the Bible come to their fulfillment in Christ and that Islam is just based on one man. So that's the diagram. And um, I can either give it to Dennis or you can send me an email and I will send it uh, to whoever wants it. Uh, uh, Mavis Price. Okay, I'll put the picture up again. Can we see the diagram again? Okay, there's a few there. So there's that there. Um, how many people will, I'm not sure. Um, okay, could you recommend a good English translation of the Quran? Could you recommend a good English translation of the Quran? There are a few that I use. One of my favorite ones is Alan Jones. That's not the news, uh, the, the radio announcer, but Alan Jones's translation, I have found to be a very helpful one. Uh, he, he taught Quranic Arabic for 40 years at, I think it was Oxford University. So he knows his English well, and he knows his Arabic well. And I found that to be a good one, but there's another good one as well. There's the, the study Quran. Um, basically, Muslims have just gone and done, you know, the, the study Bible idea, but done it with the Quran, and it's got helpful articles at the beginning, um, and, you know, fairly good commentary with useful things that you can follow through, and it's fairly critical, so it, it will bring up, you know, different opinions on things, which you, you may find helpful, so they're the two that I would use, um, yeah. Uh, now, Surah 17, Surah 17, verse 7 and 8 mentions the two temples and their destruction. Now, Paul, uh, the, when I've read that, Paul, I just wasn't as clear about it. It certainly does mention the two. And what I thought was that where it said, uh, it, it says there that if the Jews aren't careful, Allah will do it again. And that was making me think that. It's not talking about the, 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 the second destruction of the temple, but I'll take your point there and I will, um, I'll go and check that. So uh, Paul just wants to make sure that I've, I'm correct about Surah 17 verses seven and eight and the two temples and their destruction. And so you, uh, th thank you for that, Paul. 
Um, that was my reading. And uh, it's, it's quite vague. You know, it, as I said, it's from this that Muslims get the idea that Muhammad rode uh, a, 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 like a, a, a type of horse with wings to, to Jerusalem and, um, or, or had some type of vision or something like that. Uh, it, it's not that clear either way. That was my understanding, and, and I may well need to be collect, uh, corrected for that. Uh, so Bernie, hi Bernie. So are you suggesting that we learn and teach apologetics and polemics to Islam, at least at the beginning, rather than Islamic history and theology? Uh, yes, I am suggesting that. And I don't know if I brought this up in my talk. In fact, I, I don't can't remember doing it. It was one of my points. But that is, again, I'm speaking to people here from MST who very often are called upon in the church to, to, to teach others about Islam. And what I have found is that I'm in that position too. And because Islam is not a subject in Christianity, right? it's not a subject that Christians need to learn about, when we come to teach Christians in the church, we very often only get one chance. We very often only just get one chance to, to have some introduction to people, and then a few people might take it further. And so what I'm trying to do here is to, 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 to give us an approach for you know, where to start. If I've just got one 50 minutes seminar that, I've, that a church has given me to do, what's going to be most helpful to a Christian? And, and that's what I've tried to work out here. So I guess I would see that you've called it apologetics and polemics. I want to say that I'm actually just explaining a major subject in the Quran. So when I'm looking at the topic of Christianity in the Quran, as I said, there's more detail on that than there is for some of the pillars of Islam. And so I actually think that I am teaching the Quran, that I'm not just teaching apologetics and polemics, but I am actually teaching Islam. Um, but I'm I'm actually teaching something that's that, that's going to help them engage with Christians and Muslims. So yes, it is apologetics and polemics in, in that sense. Um, but of course, for those who want to know more, and this is what I have on my Engaging with Islam course, and in the book, there is Islamic history and theology and, and all of that as well. But again, I'm just looking at where do I start when I've only got a short time? And the other thing that I, I wanted to do with, with the, what I've given here is I want it to be transferable. I want a minister of a church who has not studied about Islam to be able to feel that he can teach his congregation something. And if I'm requiring that minister who has not learned about Islam at college, because Bible colleges don't really need to teach about Islam, it's more of a specialized thing, it's not in the Bible. And so most colleges just do something quite brief on it or, or nothing at all. Um, um, I want a minister to say, I can explain what the Bible is. I can explain what the Bible is and compare it to the Quran. I can explain temple theology and compare it. So that's sort of why I've gone the way I have, because I'm trying to make it something where if you've only got one opportunity, what are you going to do? And I want something that a Christian minister can pick up and go, I can run with that. So thanks, Bernie. Um, uh, anonymous attendee. Do you have pointers about how to start talking about our faith within the context of a personal relationship with a Muslim? Uh, yes, I'll give a, a brief answer to that. Uh, chapter two on my book is all about it. And there's a video on the website that comes up first about it. The question that, uh, th that I would begin with, with a Muslim is, what have you heard about Christianity? That's where I normally start with Muslims. Um, I don't want to ask them a I don't want to particularly ask them about Jesus just to start off with, because I might get into some argument or something. I want to listen to them about what they've heard about Christianity. And so um, I was talking to a, a Muslim gentleman at my university and we sat down, we're having coffee. You know, we met each other on campus. We sat down, we had a coffee. And I said to him, so what have you heard about Christianity? And he said, oh, you know, you've, um, that Jesus never died on the cross. There was something about Jonah or something and Jonah, I can't remember. Um, and then um, he was saying he couldn't remember. And then you've changed the Bible. And, 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 he, and he just started saying all this stuff. And I went, oh, wow, okay. 
And it was really helpful for me to know that. And then I just said to him, well, do, do, you, do you believe that? And he goes, oh, I've never really looked into it. But, uh, and so that's how I like to start. And again, I like to start there because I, I don't want to have to talk about Islam. I want to talk about Christianity. But if I ask the Muslim, what have they been taught about Christianity? They actually think that I'm asking them about Islam. And so you, you could go to Malaysia or somewhere and you could say to them, you know, somewhere where it's difficult to share the gospel. And you could say to a Muslim in Malaysia, um, what does Islam teach about Christianity? And they can tell you that. They can tell you that, that they could explain it. And you could find out where that person is coming from. And then you ask them, is that what you believe? So that's how I normally start. I've got a lot more material in my book um, and on the, in the training course. And um, so just have a look there. And I've got little leaflets and, and different things to do. But that's where I would start. Um, what do you think is better? So this is from uh, Elspeth. What do you think is better to share with a Muslim? Um, so a chronological Bible story. Uh, so, sorry, so chronological Bible. So one, chronological Bible storytelling. Or two, Old Testament prophets, then Jesus. Look, they're both great ways. I... I can't really say which one's better. Uh, for me, I like to do what I've said. I like to ask them what they've heard about Christianity. Um, I listen to them. My next thing is to explain what the Bible is. So I always move on then to explain what the Bible is and how it's all the prophets. I then invite them to read Matthew's gospel. So I guess it depends on how much time you're going to get with this Muslim. Sometimes you may only get one or two meetings. If you're going to get lots of meetings, then I think you've got more options before you. But, you know, for, for probably half of the meetings that I get with Muslims, they're just a couple of meetings. Other ones will be longer. Both of the ways that, that you've described there are excellent ways. Uh, so going through the biblical story, and um, there's that one, this book here, uh, all the prophets have spoken. I guess many of you will know that, and, and, and that's a, a great way of doing it. There's probably other ones as well. And the biblical prophecies, look, they're both great. Um, I can't really say which one's better. I would leave that up to you. But I would begin either of those by making sure I have explained what the Bible is. I would not just go straight to assuming that they know what the Bible is. I, I, whenever I talk to a Muslim, I want them to know that the Bible is all of the prophets. That's, that's where I begin. Um, Adrian. Hi, Samuel. Thank you uh, for this valuable perspective. I think I heard you say Christians believe in all the prophets. Wouldn't a Muslim take this to include their prophet, Muhammad? Uh, this is not the case. And you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, the point still remains, though, when you show them that diagram, and um, one of the things I do if I'm training people on, on how to sh explain the Bible to a Muslim, the way that I do it is my first Bible study with a Muslim is the table of contents. Okay, I take them to the table of contents, and I go through each of the prophets and explain who each of the prophets are. I show them some prophets that they're familiar with, so Moses, Job, David, Jonah, and I might even show them the, the books, take them from the table of contents to, to the book and say, look, here's the actual prophet themselves. Here's the actual book themselves. Here's the original story that, you know, the Quran just alludes to. So I would show them that. Uh, and, but I also might show them some prophets they don't know, like Elijah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel, and really show them from the table of contents that that Christians, you know, believe all these prophets. Now, they might say, well, why don't you believe in Muhammad? And the answer to that would be, well, uh, because he doesn't agree with these prophets. And this gives me an, an opportunity to explain that, to say, well, Muhammad just doesn't agree with them. You could show them that table. You can also say, well, you don't believe in all the prophets. You, you know, you don't believe in Baha'i Allah. There's only, you know, you've got your reasons for not accepting the Baha'i religion. We've got our reasons for not accepting Muhammad. And then you could invite them to have a look at it. But the point still remains that Christians don't believe one prophet, right? Our Bible is not just the writings of Paul. 
right? See, because that's what the Quran actually is. Imagine if our Bible was just from Romans to Philemon, right? Well, how does Romans begin? With creation, right? Romans be begins with creation, talks about the apostles. Um, uh, you know, you, know you, you, you can go through Paul's writings and actually get a number of the apostles' uh, names. You get certain things about Jesus. You get stories about Abraham, Adam, you know, you, you get that. Well, the Quran is just one man telling you what to believe, but the Bible's not that. The Bible is all of the prophets. And, and that point still stands, even if we don't accept Muhammad. Um, can love and gentleness assist preaching? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you, you need to be loving and kind. And in fact, that, that's the first chapter of my book. My, the first chapter of my book is called Love Everyone. And um, I, I begin the book by saying, by saying that. And I always uh, show Muslims respect and honour. Um, some Christians don't like me doing that, but I believe that that's what we're called to do. I believe that's how scripture um, asks me to engage with other people. And so I, I always show respect and honour and always try to give them, I'm happy for them to have the last word. I'm happy for you know, a whole range of things. Um, because I think that's how we're to live as Christians and engage with others. So our manner is very important in this regard. I'll move down to Sonia. Um, okay, no, I won't. Her thing's already been answered. How much of your understanding of the Quran has come from your investigation of the text and how much from discourse with Muslims, with Muslim teachers around the Quran? I ask as I am curious that plenty of non-Christians uh, may tell me about the Bible, but they haven't, uh, uh, but they haven't approached the scriptures in the right way. Yeah, so I've learned Arabic, and so I I read the Quran in Arabic, uh, you know, slowly. If, um, so I'm not a fluent reader, but I I can read anywhere in the Quran if I sit down and get out my dictionary, um, and I. I read it myself, but I'm involved in chat groups where I'm always listening to Muslims, listening to their interpretation. And, and I think the great thing about debating Muslims is that you make friendships with them because as, as I showed at the beginning of my talk, uh, the Quran is a debate against Christianity. And so Muslims aren't offended if you want to debate them. That's, that's actually just doing ministry with them. And so... Uh, as long as you're respectful, you'll, you'll learn from them, you know. And so I've got some Muslim friends where I, if, if I've got a question about a hadith, say if I want to use a hadith or a verse of the Quran, I've got a couple of Muslim friends who I will send that verse off and just say, can you tell me about this? And so, so I listen to Muslims. I listen to what they say to me. I ask for their advice. I read their books and I read the Quran. I've read all of Bukhari. Um you know, and I'm happy to be corrected. Um, Benin, uh, if you are not the Jews, the temple may be too difficult for many. If you are not the Jews, the temple theology may be too difficult for many. I want to say yes and no. I think it, it may be difficult, but I'd say that for Christians... We have to learn that. Uh, I'm not 100% sure where you may want to go with this, but to me, temple theology is the basic bread and butter of the Bible. Much of the Bible is based around God coming to dwell with his people, God being a holy God who can't dwell with his people. Therefore, you need a priest and a sacrifice of atonement to approach God. As I said, it's those doctrines which make up a lot of the Bible, and it's those doctrines that are the foundation for Christian for our Christology. So I, I, I think if we're not teaching those to Christians, then you know we should be. Now I think that for Jews, though, it may actually be slightly the opposite. You might say that um, if you're not a Jew, then temple theology may be too difficult. For most Jews today, they I'm not sure how much they even know their temple theology. Um, I've debated Rabbi Tavia Singer as well. And so you can see my debate with him. And for a lot of Jews, 
uh, temple theology is not what they're you know, what they're being exposed to either. Rabbinic Judaism doesn't really emphasize temple theology. For instance, when they have um, you know the Day of Atonement, what's it for? The Day of Atonement is to cleanse the temple uh, of all the defilement from from the Israelites living around it. Well, there is no temple. They still celebrate it, but there's no temple. So, you know, um, um, so either way, temple theology is very important for Christians. So we actually do need to be teaching it. And, and this is my point that I'm not asking Christians to learn lots of information about Islam. What I'm saying is we need to learn our own faith better. And what I'm trying to say here is that if we want to have a way that's going to be usable for the Christian church and beneficial to the Christian church, we need to figure out what are the aspects of Christianity that we can teach and teach our own people things we should already be teaching them, which are going to particularly equip them to talk to Islam, to talk to Muslims. And that's what I believe temple theology and explaining what the Bible is does. That it's teaching Christianity to explain Islam. Um, uh, anonymous attendee, why do Muslims seek to immigrate to Judeo-Christian heritage countries rather than settle in other Muslim countries? This is something I'm trying to understand. Well, th there's a whole range of reasons. Uh, in the modern period, I would say it's because um, the Judeo-Christian countries are doing much better and their countries have got significant problems. And so they're, they're, they're leaving. They're, they're leaving their own countries um, and they're, they're coming to the Christian, Judeo-Christian countries where things are peaceful and things work much better. It's, just, it's as simple as that. Um, okay. A few more questions here. How do you overcome Muslims' objections that the Bible is corrupt uh, enough that they would be interested in looking into our Bible? That's a great question. And again, th this is a, a, a topic that I, I do when I talk about how to start an evangelistic conversation. And I've already mentioned it briefly. The way that um, the first thing I do is I ask Muslims what they have heard about Christianity. I listen to them, ask if they believe it. And then I say to them, can I show you one thing? And what I show them is, I say to them, I want to show you what's inside the Bible. I was doing some walk-up evangelism in Lakemba uh, one day, and, and I met a Muslim man, and I, I, I did this with him. His name was Adam. And, um, and I, I showed him the table of contents, and I explained to him that the, the Bible contains all of the prophets. And, and he said to me, that's really, really interesting. He goes, I never knew that. You know, because most Muslims think that the Bible is just like the Quran. Right? They think the Bible's like the Quran. And so they think, you know, you, you, we've got our book from our prophet. You've got your book from the, your prophet. And, uh, and that's actually one reason why I think we shouldn't make Bibles look like the Quran, because they're actually nothing like each other. But that's, that's another um, thing to, to talk about for another time. Um, and so what I have found is that I want to, first of all, show them that all the, the Bible is all the prophets. Now, for a lot of them, they are then happy to, because they've now found something new about the Bible, something that's actually interesting, right? Most of them don't know that the Bible is all of the prophets. And so when you show them something really interesting about the Bible, which is obviously true, then for many, they'll go, wow, I didn't know that. And then that's when I invite them to, to read the Gospel of Matthew. So I always carry around Gospel of Matthews with me when I'm in taxis or something. And I'll have this conversation with them and I'll try to get them to read uh, Matthew. So I've tried to get them interested in the Bible and then I'll show that. Now, if they then say to you, oh, yeah, but the Bible's corrupted, the Bible's corrupted. My, my response, my first response would be, um, well, look, you're changing the subject there, right? You're changing the subject. And because Muslims learn how to talk to Christians, they are masters at changing the subject. And very often we just let them change the subject on us and just let them lead us around and we just follow them around, right? You mustn't let them change the subject on you. We're showing them that the Bible is all the prophets. If they say, oh yeah, yeah but the, if they're corrupt, you say, well, hang on, you've just changed the subject. 
we've changed the subject. The point is you follow one man, I follow all the prophets. If you want to say it's corrupt, that's another thing. We can talk about that for another time. So that's my first response. I don't let them change the subject. I want to drive home and really massage it in, polish it in, take time for them to understand that they follow one man and I follow all the prophets. Now, if they say to you, uh, you know, the Bible's corrupted, and again, I go through this in my book, they're actually only telling you half of what they believe. They're only telling you half of what they believe because Muslims, when they say to you the Bible's corrupted, that's not what they're thinking. That's only half of what they're thinking. What they're thinking is the Bible is corrupted and there's one perfect Quran. That's the whole argument. That's the whole thing that they've got in their head. They're thinking the Bible's corrupted and there's one perfect Quran. So if a Muslim says to me, the Bible's corrupted, you need to understand that's not what they're saying. What they're, you know, and so I say to them, are you saying the Bible's corrupted and there's one perfect Quran? You've got to get them to, to actually be honest about what they're actually saying. And so they'll either say, yes, that's what I'm saying. Or if they're a bit more educated, they, they may be a little cautious there. Because as I'm sure Bernie has taught you, and um, as, as people on this group probably already know, there are, there are many different versions of the Quran. I've got, here are, three, here are three different Arabic versions of the Quran that I've got from different parts of the world. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll say to the Muslim, uh, are you saying the Bible's corrupt and there's one perfect Quran? And then I will take the conversation from there. I've got a booklet that you can download free from the website called The Preservation of the Quran. You can print that out, give it to them, and uh, it, it just shows the different versions of the Quran and, and uh, the other information which will help you get a balanced picture and have a balanced conversation with them. And that's how I would um, progress after I've um, showed them what the Bible is. Um, now, uh, Willy Wong, how do you engage with Muslims who are not familiar with their own scripture, but are generally steeped in Islamic traditions and practices? Look, I, I use exactly what I've just said here. Um, if they're watching Islamic TV, they're, they're hearing about Christianity. They're listening to Zakia Naik or whoever it is. Um, I, I know Muslims, I've, I've got a Muslim friend and he, he actually brings the beer to the Christmas party. Well, I invite him to Christmas and he brings the beer. And so, but he still watches Islamic TV, right? Um, so he doesn't read the Quran, doesn't know anything, but he, he's got the Islamic traditions. I, I begin as I do with any Muslim. What have you heard about Christianity? Listen to them. Do you believe it? Can I show you what, what the Bible is? Table of contents, and then invite them to read Matthew. So that, that's, just, that's just my standard approach, whether they're a devout Muslim or just a, a nominal Muslim. Um, how do you overcome fear of telling Muslims uh, the gospel? Now, I actually deal with this in chapter one of my book. And so thank you for bringing that up. When I first started, I was quite fearful. I was, I was very fearful when I first started. I remember going to the Ahmed Dadat meeting in Sydney Town Hall in 1996 and being absolutely terrified. Um, uh, I had a big debate with um, with uh, brother Imram at, in Bankstown in Sydney, and uh, but basically I just arrived by myself, and there were eleven hundred beards and burkas. I, I was terrified. I was, so I, I often get very fearful when I do this, but what I have found is that you need to deal with your fear in the same way that you deal with other areas of godliness in your Christian life. So just as we need to grow in our prayer life, just as we need to grow in our Bible reading, so too you need to bring your, your prayers to God and you need to, to ask God for help in this area. What I have found is that the more Muslims I've spoken to, the less fearful I've become. And so I would say, pray about it to God, seek to grow in this area um, and, and just keep talking to Muslims. And you'll, I have found in my experience that I'm, I'm no longer afraid 
you know, sometimes there are fearful situations that arise, but you know, they're fairly rare and then you'll be afraid at that time, but not most of the time. Uh, Sonia, they also go to other Islamic countries. Pakistan, for example, already hosts 3 million Afghan refugees. Thank you, Sonia. Turkey has 850,000 Uzbeks. Um, Iran has many Muslim refugees. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Sonia, for, for giving us the, the balanced picture there. Um, the, the Muslim world has, has lots of its own refugees. They're caring for them within themselves. Um, so Elspeth again. So is it a good idea to ask a Muslim to share a story they know about Hagar or Moses, et cetera, and then share a similar story from the Bible? Uh, what might the challenges be? Thank you for that. That's actually an excellent um, question. Uh, sorry, yeah, an excellent question. When I'm showing Muslims the table of contents, I've actually found it helpful to, to do exactly what Elspeth has said, and that is to look at parallel sections of um, to, to look at parallel sections between the Quran and the Bible. And you, you can actually show them really helpful things. So for instance, um, and I, I don't have the, the notes right here, um, but uh, it's in my book and, um, and it, it, I, I can send you the notes if you want. And, and I guess mo most of the people watching this video would be familiar with the Quran and Bible anyway. So you'd have your own references that you want to go to. But I like to show parallel sections, for instance, um, with the days of creation. So the Quran has a few verses in it, maybe five verses where it says that Allah created the world in six days, something like that. It's one verse. And so I've looked at that with a Muslim. And then I'll say, do you want to see where that is in the Torah? And then we go to Genesis chapter one and we read the whole chapter. And I say to them, what do you notice? And, and what they notice is that the Torah, the, the Bible, has the original story and it has the complete story. And the Quran is just giving some of the information. Now, you can do this with Jonah. The, the Quran uh, has about five verses on Jonah. They're fairly short verses. And so you can read with the Muslim the story of Jonah in the Quran and then go and read the whole of Jonah in the Bible. And it's only, um, I think it's only two and a half pages or something. It's not very long. So you can read it in about 10 minutes. And again, you can ask them, what do you notice? And what they'll notice is that the Bible has the original book from the original prophet. It's got the prophet Jonah's book. It has the complete story. Uh, it has so the original story, the complete story, and the Quran just has some of the story. You know, Muhammad is just using part of part of the story as an illustration. And really, you can say to them, if you actually want to know what Muhammad is talking about, if you want to know what the Quran's referring to, then you need to go and read the Bible because the Quran is assuming that you know these biblical stories. Right. In fact, there are parts of the Quran where it will say, remember the story of Moses, remember the story of you know, whoever. And it, it, you know, the Quran is written in a context where people knew biblical stories. And so it's assuming that people know them. So that's how I would do that. I'd look at uh, Job or some of the other ones I look at. So the creation account, Job. Uh, yeah, so you, you can look at Job, you can look at Jonah and do a parallel that way but do it as a way of showing what the Bible is. Um, I was told that Christians in Muslim countries pray in the name of Allah, which I'm told is a generic term for God, but yet the Bible never tells us that this is the name for the true God. So is it right for Christians to say Allah in their prayers? Look, I'm not going to speak for Arabic speaking Arabic speaking Christians, they've had a long history of working that out themselves. And so you may want to speak to some Syrians or some Lebanese or someone and find out from them what they do. But what I can say is that the word that the name Allah is not the word for God, right? The word Allah is not the word for God. In Arabic, the word is Ilah. And so in the, the Shahada, the Islamic confession of faith it is there is no illa but allah 
right? So it actually uses two different words there. The first is the, the word for God. The second is the word is the name of God. Now, in the Bible, how this corresponds, not that it corres corresponds in terms of truth, but how it, the correspondence would be in the Bible, Elohim is the word for God. And Yahweh is the name is the, the the name of God. So the Quran actually doesn't know the name Yahweh. It never uses that word. The, the Quran never uses that word. Um, and the, in fact, the Quran gives an alternative name. Uh, it doesn't, uh, Muhammad did not prophesy in the name of Yahweh, as Deuteronomy 18 says, a true prophet must. He didn't prophesy in the name of Yahweh. He prophesied in the name of another God. And so um, Allah is the name. Uh, it, it, but in some cultures, Allah just might be the word for God. But in Islamic theology and in the Quran, it's the name of God. So um, take it from there. Uh, why the Gospel of Matthew first? I have just found that Matthew has many parts in it which Muslims find really helpful. So it begins with a, an interesting genealogy with names that they're familiar. It moves on to the, the birth narratives, which they know about. It has John the Baptist. I found that the, um, that the Sermon on the Mount is an excellent thing for Muslims to read, that, that I give Muslims to read during Ramadan. So I've got a booklet on my website that you can download called The Messiah and Ramadan. And this is the booklet I'll hand out. And it's, it's the Sermon on the Mount and John 13. And I, I'm not sure if there's anything else in it. I can't remember now. And the idea there is, um, you know, Jesus is talking about praying and fasting and giving. And the Quran actually doesn't give you much, info, much useful information about that. It does a little bit. But when you read the Sermon of the Mount, you get really heart penetrating uh, it, it, teaching on these things. And so I found that giving that to Muslims is just something that they, makes the Bible really interesting to them. And so that they come away going, wow, that was really interesting, right? And that's, that's what I want to do. I want to get them reading the Bible and saying, the Bible's good. You know, I had a taste, come and see, and it, it was good. So, um, you know, it talks about, um, yeah, anyway, so th th that's what I like to do, uh, Matthew, first. Um, thank you, Ian. Uh, Sonia, um, only one thing, uh, only, uh, sorry, only thing is that mostly, they will not be allowed to completely integrate there. Okay. Um, um, uh, and they can in so-called Judeo-Christian countries. I am a journalist on this issue. Thank you very much, Sonia. So those, uh, those Muslims who are refugees in other Muslim countries, Sonia's saying to us, and she seems to know about this, that they're, they're not able to completely integrate. Um, whereas when they come to the West, they can be part of a multicultural society. Um, is Allah the moon god? I know you hear that around. Um, I maybe at some stage in the past, but I, I, I to be honest, I haven't really looked into that um, because what I have looked into just made me think they're not using Muslims don't mean Allah to mean the moon god. Uh, it, it's it's not how the word is being used by Muslims. And it does seem to be that Allah was one of the pantheon of gods amongst the people of Arabia at the time. Um, uh, but whether or not he's the moon god, I'm not exactly sure. I just haven't found any value in pursuing that question. So sorry, it, it may be a good question, but uh, it just seems to me that um, you know, the Quran's pretty clear on what it means. And it's trying to say that Allah is, is the one god and not particularly uh, a moon god. But it may have its history in the worship of the moon. Um, Professor Sidney H. Griffith wrote many articles and books on the subject of Arabic Christians and Christianity. So thanks for that, Sonia. Professor Sidney H. Griffith. He's an author that you may like to search in the MST library or online, and uh, he could tell you more about Arabic Christians. So um, we're finishing up there. Thank you everyone for those questions. Thank you to everyone who corrected me uh, in terms of uh, Muhammad's immigration, uh, not going to Yemen. And, um, and 
on the meaning of what happened to the temple in Surah 17. And uh, thank you for picking me up on that. And uh, it's, it's good. So thank you. Thank you very much, Samuel, for the great lecture. And thank you for all these answers to these questions. And uh, thank you, everyone who joined tonight. And I just wanted to remind you that uh, this webinar was recorded. So we will send you an email with the link to this recording and also with more information on the courses that we are having here at AGC and also links to Samuel Green's website and information about his book. Thank you very much again for attending tonight. Thank you.